Um, I'm, I'm going to throw one or two questions to the panel uh, first. Uh, Jane, I know you've just sat down, you're catching your breath, but what really strikes me um, about that project is I'm one of what Paul would call the holdouts, um, not on Twitter, not on Facebook, mainly for my mental health. It's bad enough I argue with people in my head all day. I don't want to argue with them on the internet. I live in a small village. The people I meet every day are not on Twitter. And all of this is completely missing then. You know, when you acknowledged yourself that, you know, you resorted to this method because you didn't have the resources to reach the offline people who are many, is there a danger that um, by consulting this community on those big issues, that is skewing the debate um, in a very particular way? Well, no, because first of all, we're not consulting these people, yeah. so we're using this as um, a way to get it out. So there's as many journalists on local radio and as many journalists in, in local media who are on Twitter. And um, so we all spent, oh, I don't know, but a lot of hours on, um, on local radio. Um, we've, we've written hundreds, I'd say, of pieces for, for local newspapers. That, so the thing is that it's a way of getting in, there's, but we wouldn't have a way to reach all of those local newspapers and everything without Twitter. So it allows so us these direct are access in. These are gatekeepers a lot, yeah. to the And writer. then some of them, well, as you describe them as the chattering classes, the, the Twitterati. So it's a way of engaging with them, which of course drives greater debate. And then they put it up on other blogs and other websites. And then it goes, you know what I mean? And then it gets into RT, it gets onto BBC, you know, it becomes a, a bigger debate. So it's not about having to reach. So for example, in the Constitutional Convention, we're going around, I think, eight different uh, towns over October and November to see because there's one issue that's going to be allowed just to free you know, the, con the convention to discuss itself. So the members want to see what it is the people around the country. So hopefully we'll get that out and then people in your small village will be able to turn out to the meeting and, and tell us what they would like discussed. Okay, and then just for Andy, um, uh, I'm going to mention two names, one of which uh, might make Dan Gilmore uh, pale in his boots as he did earlier when I mentioned him, um, Veni Morisov, I don't know if you're familiar no, no, yeah, with his work, yeah. and Malcolm Gladwell. And th they both uh, take a quite a sceptical view of the role of uh, the internet, in particular Twitter, in relation to the Arab Spring. Um, so for example, Gladwell would argue that the links that people built up, say, during the civil rights movement may have been much slower than you can achieve during a democracy movement in the Middle East, but they were much, much stronger and ultimately much more successful uh, as a result of that. And then Marasov would argue that while uh, social media, you know, can be useful, um, you know, in those uprisings, authoritarian regimes we're able to turn the internet against those protesters because it's so much easier uh, for surveillance and propaganda and censorship when you can use the internet to track who's saying what about you. Well, I think Yevgeny is being very selective when it comes to the history and how it played out. In the cases of both Tunisia and Egypt, the governments were completely flat-footed. Um, the Tunisians at best would uh, block certain websites and they would occasionally try to fish uh, Facebook uh, uh, accounts from people, but they were ultimately unsuccessful. In the case of Egypt, they were so perplexed they decided to unplug the internet for three days, which all that did was cause people to go out in the streets and ask their neighbors what's going on. So it actually doubled the amount of people going on in the streets. Honestly, the only country where you really got to see the government doing it right from their perspective was Bahrain, because you've got a country there where almost everyone's online to begin with. It's a very well-off country. And there were plenty of people in the country that supported the government to begin with, so they fought fire with fire as far as social media was concerned. They also hired PR companies to create online personas to basically make the argument that everything is okay and the protesters are terrorists. And uh, so, they were on top of things and, and they were able to swing things in their favor. In the case of a country like Egypt right now, the reason why the, the, the liberals there are essentially on the losing side of everything has nothing to do with Twitter except for the fact that they probably wasted too much time on Twitter early on when they should have been canvassing uh, and when they should have been putting together political platforms. But they didn't have the political experience. 
um, you know, rev revolutionaries like to be revolutionaries and it's hard to adjust to a period of where you'd be responsible for elections and governance and they didn't make the transition. Whereas the Muslim Brotherhood had been waiting 80 years for the opportunity to do that. So, um, you know, it's, it, it's, it's really hard to say. I, th I think um, Yevgeny uh, makes an argument against a point of view that I don't know anyone who actually has. I don't know people who say that uh, social media caused these revolutions. I think most people say they played a role, but uh, lots of things played lots of roles, and I don't think, I, I don't think it's, it makes sense to pick on one specific aspect because you could pick, you could just as much say uh, corruption or certain aspects of the culture or Al Jazeera, uh, text messaging. There's no way we can fully measure all of these things to point to one of them. And so uh, I tend to avoid these debates of did it do it or did it not do it? Because the answer is always somewhere in between. Um, Paul, again on that issue of the effect of social media on democracy, and you were mentioning, uh, you know, how you have all these conversations with politicians, and then you might actually meet them and. They for sure perhaps think that you're, you're not quite as bad as you appear to be on Twitter. You mentioned you're more aggressive um, in social media than you are personally. Is that a negative effect on democracy if uh, people get to know a politician or a journalist through this kind of bizarre filter, really, in which only a version of themselves is presented? Well, I think, I think on the blog with the Guido Forbes uh, brand, we're in the infotainment business, so people expect us to get into fights, and um, it's not always me doing the tweets, by the way, there's three of us, mm -hmm. and it's, it's, it's part of the game, and we are entertaining our readers, so they expect me to get into fights with, you know, we, we're right of centre, we fight with left of centre people, and they say, oh, this is terrible, and the Twitter followers count goes up. Is democracy worse or better with Guido Fox? Oh, you know, I think we've put some politicians in jail. I think we've done good things. Um, so we're better. Okay, well on that <coughs> note, any questions if I put it open to the floor now? Great, over here. Yeah, the one on the opposite side of the room. Sorry, Stephen. <laughs> Quick question for Andy Carvin. I'm just curious, has NPR ever tried to move you over to a branded corporate account rather than your own personal account? No, never. Um, and I, I th I'm glad they haven't, and I think they know it's not a good idea. The closest that's come to that is there were points during the Arab Spring where they asked if I wanted to have my Twitter account mirrored on the NPR homepage. And I said, well, only if you're prepared to show body parts of children to the public. Because the stuff I'm dealing with is very, very raw and disturbing and uncensored. And um, there's awful stuff that you would never see pass through mainstream media or through mass media traditional channels because of just the history of mass media where people would get up in the morning and read the paper at their breakfast table and then watch the TV news as a family at night, uh, a certain amount of discretion became baked into the, uh, to the editorial decisions that were made. Whereas on Twitter, people get to make an informed choice, ideally, about what they're going to see. And so when I receive content that's graphic, I will include a warning that's very blunt, saying you're about to see body parts here or whatever, and then always includes the word graphic. So my Twitter followers know what to expect, and many of them say, I, I don't open your stuff, but thank you for, for explaining what it is. Uh, I wouldn't want to put NPR in a position to, to have that stuff blow back on them, and I wouldn't want to be in a position where I'm censoring myself when I'm trying to offer as uh, unvarnished a view of what's happening in these various protests and revolutions, uh, because Twitter has certain affordances that allow us to do it in ways that's different from from traditional media. Mm. Len, Stephen, Andy, how does your reporting, which I would call what you're doing, reporting, how does it make its way to the NPR, the larger NPR audience? It depends. Uh, during Tunisia, uh, I ended up maintaining uh, uh, part of our breaking news blog, uh, the two-way we had a, what's called a Storify page built into it, which is a mechanism for keeping track of social media artifacts and telling stories with them. And so it was like I was live blogging, but not exactly. And so people could find that there. Uh, other times, uh, our breaking news bloggers and members of our foreign, uh, foreign desk would monitor my Twitter account, and we'd be in touch with each other via email. 
uh, or in other cases, I'd be in touch with reporters on the ground and I would pass them intelligence back and forth. You know, one example was we had a reporter at the Rixos Hotel in, in Tripoli and she wanted to interview military commanders in Misrata, but she knew if she picked up the phone and tried to figure out who these guys were, every call she didn't make would be traced. Um, but uh, at the time, uh, we were pretty sure the, uh, the government in Libya hadn't figured out Skype yet. And so I basically made the arrangements as matchmaker trying to find the different military commanders she was interested in and then set up a group Skype chat for them. Uh, so in that sense, there were times I was acting as a social media producer for the desk. And then on other occasions, I would, just, I would write or they would have me, uh, they would bring me on to do what we'd call a two-way. So the host on air would, you know, would interview me on air to ask what have I been finding in this particular context. I didn't do it very often uh, because part of the goal of this was the ex just uh, the experiment to see if we really just concentrated on Twitter and social media without an expectation that there would be... Um, news products coming out of it that would be traditionally for the website or for the radio. Uh, other reporters could glean on what I was doing, but they wanted me to stick with Twitter just to see how that went. So, uh, so it was a bit of a mix. And, and just following through from that um, uh, original question about the moving to the corporate account, you know, is there an aspect where NPR might prefer you to stick with your personal account in case you make a mistake? Oh, absolutely. Sometime? Absolutely. I mean, there's, there's plausible deniability in my yeah. personal account. Yeah. Uh, Especially because they know part of what I do is I deal in rumors. Uh, but in the context of people, well, actually, I don't know if you've been online right now, but there's a shooting going on in D.C. right now. Oh. Um, uh, possible multiple shooters at the Washington Naval Yard, uh, several dead, at least 10 injured. And uh, the information we're get, that's coming through is, is completely contradictory in terms yeah. of the number of shooters and all that. And, and we saw that during Newtown. We saw that during Aurora and other, uh, uh, and other circumstances online. Uh, and so um, when, when I'm trying to figure out what's going on, my Twitter account is a safe, safer place to do that. Now, there's still some people out there who think that I have no business making these discussions online and we should be doing this quietly by ourselves in the newsroom. But the way I look at it is, for better or for worse, social media has enabled people to engage in their own rumor mongering. And in, in many cases, they're doing it thinking quite sincerely that they have the right information. And as, a, as someone working in the news business uh, and working at NPR, we could choose to essentially ignore that conversation and stick to what we do best on radio or the website. Or we could recognize the confusion that's taking place in there and dive into it head first. Not, not all reporters, but you know, have an element of our, of our newsroom in that space to help them work through what's true and what's not. Because a lot of those folks who, who are hitting the retweet button about there being five shooters or something like that, they're not gonna hear the top of the hour newscast by us. They haven't turned on CNN necessarily, but they're having the conversation there. And, of course, during the Boston bombings, the police actually asked people to stop tweeting, didn't they? Because it was interfering. They with did, the yeah. I mean, that's happened in, in several other law enforcement incidents. And, mm -hmm. and I've, I've, I've only seen during the, the, the terrorist attack in Mumbai where media outlets obeyed it, whereas in, in the case of Boston, I didn't see anyone stop. Um, a Peter, and then this lady here in the middle, then, Stephen. Yeah. Uh, question for, for Paul. Um, I was uh, really intrigued by your disclosure about um, working for mainstream politicians. Uh, I can imagine Guido would probably be quite coruscating about political editors of uh, <coughs> traditional news organizations who are also advising the parties. Just interested in what policies, if any, you have uh, about the conduct of your, of, of, of your operation. Um. It's, it's been reported, it's declared. Uh, the Times has done me over every time they look through my, the uh, declarations. Uh, we did very successful work for Boris Johnson, um, no to AV. Uh, we worked for the Conservatives. We worked over here on a few campaigns. You can guess which ones. Um, yeah. so, it's, so it's fine as long as it's transparent. There doesn't need to be any particular guidelines or anything like that. I'm just interested in genuinely well, about uh, how like, like Blue State Digital, we only work for uh, people whose values we share. So it's, it's, you know, I'm not going to go work for um, uh, We the Citizen, for instance. <laughs> <laughs> Has it affected how you report, though, on those people? Or is it always hands-off anyway because you agree with them anyway? Uh, not really. It, has, it, gets, it gets into conflicts, but... Um, 
the blog nowadays is written by staff more than me. I, I mean, I'm about 20% of it. Okay. More, more, more sort of directorial. Yeah. Uh, a follow-up uh, in, in, a, in a way to this. Um, this is a question to Paul primarily, but to the rest of the panel as well. I think that we see an increasing professionalization of social media communication, and I was wondering what you, the panel thought about this, especially in terms of the relationship between social media and democracy. Well, the IPOs of Facebook and Twitter mean that they have to make money, and that means all of us who are using social media for free have to pay. So you might not realize this, but when you like something on Facebook, it used to be the case that that sustained itself, and as more and more people liked it, it got more and more um, popular. Now it tapers, and uh, certainly brands, Coca-Cola and people like that, are having to pay to keep their uh, prominence up. And all these things subtly coming into social media that used to be um, much fairer, and you know, the more fairness you got, the better it worked, now it's pay to play in a big way. Yeah, in the case of Twitter, there's definitely been a, a, a slow but steady shift over the last couple of years in which they are catering more to the casual Twitter user rather than the power users, um, making tools simpler to use by removing a lot of the functionalities, giving people uh, discovery routes where they can find their favorite celebrities and sports stars. And so, you know, a lot of the, the early mystique of Twitter where it was a level playing field and, and, uh, and all of that, that's, it's, 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 it's definitely going in a different direction now. I think as well, though, that there's, um, there's a big difference even if you look at the, the politicians or the journalists who were engaging, you know, two or three years ago, they're all a lot more careful now. So there's, well, there's a lot more of listening to the, you know, don't, don't drink and tweet, um, but also an awful lot less kind of personal things. So it's much more corporate. People are much more careful. And more and more organizations are coming out with, you know, this is official so social media policy. So even the media ones like RTE is developing theirs, I believe, you know, which will make the, the sort of the lives of individual journalists who are using it very different, you know, where you have to be careful. So I think it's changing in that way as well. Any more questions? Um, oh, watch here. Yeah, Horik. Sorry, that's a question and just a comment to, add to <clears throat> your own comment earlier on about the, um, the reality that the vast majority of, we'd say, you know, nine to five day, day workers are probably not Twitter users or certainly not Twitter users during the course of the day. As somebody who comes from the PR world, I would say it would be very much part of the planning at this stage. And I've seen it happen certainly for corporate programs or major public awareness programs where an initiative like what Jane talked about where you actually look at, at a cohort of people who will be talking around the subject and might then be writing in the mainstream media but are talking among themselves on Twitter, that the Twitter engagement would be for that purpose, would be to influence that group. And it does obviously bring up the question, if we go back to what we talked about earlier in the day, as to whether then the public at large can trust the news correspondents who might be part of a conversation might be there for influenced or overly influenced by that. And I think it was touched on by a speaker on the far side of the room in relation to the, um, some, some past um, war efforts. Ultimately, you know, that is a target that, that the PR industry is going to do, and I can say that as somebody who's in it. It's a legitimate approach to engaging with the media, but ultimately the, the media have to have their filters on for that, and that's part of what we as consumers have to trust them to do. So I'm getting a sense actually that there's this increasing corporatization of social media. So what people like about Twitter is that it is democratic, it is just regular users, but very much in the way, say, that Google has turned the internet into people looking at Wikipedia, IMDB, and YouTube. You know, it's narrowed it. Do you see Twitter going that way too, and that that grassroots element of it is, is going to fade out in the coming years? Well, I think the, the general audience for Twitter will continue to use it as a form of entertainment and talking with their friends because that's what 99% of the public does. You know, the people that I end up working with on Twitter, they are outliers to begin with. Yeah. But, you know, if 10% if of the public on Twitter were interested in working with me, it, it wouldn't scale. And so it's actually useful for me that the, the people I'm working with are the ones truly committed to 
uh, sorting through fact from fiction. I, I don't need a large community of people doing it. I, was, I feel like I was just as effective doing this when I had two or 3,000 Twitter followers as I do now, at, you know, approaching 100,000 followers. You know, there, wasn't, there wasn't a specific tipping point where it was like, oh, I could do this. It's because I, I spent all of this time cultivating relationships with people on Twitter who I knew would either have expertise or the eagerness to collaborate on things. Okay, well look, we may leave it there. Kevin's giving me the signal uh, at the, from the back of the room. So, um, Andy Carvin, Paul Staines, Jane Suter, many thanks. <laughs>